Hey guys, it's Mrs. Straitman. I'm just going to walk you through some of the key beliefs of the Enlightenment philosophers that we're going to study. There are four of them all together. Um, but first, I think we should review what the Age of Enlightenment actually is. So let's take a look at that. So the Age of Enlightenment is a period in the 18th century in Europe where science and philosophical thought and idea um, leads the way instead of just religion and tradition and dogma. So people are asking why. They're thinking outside the box. They're questioning everything from why they exist to why their government works the way it does to um, just scientific questions about why the world functions in particular ways. So it's philosophical, it's scientific, it's all about exploration and learning and asking why, and not just accepting what generations before you have told you is true. I'd like to think that we're sort of like in this now perpetual age of enlightenment. Lucky for you guys. All right, so there are four philosophers we'll look at, as I said, Locke, um, Montesquieu, Voltaire, and Rousseau. And we'll take a look at each guy. And we're going to go in chronological order. It's important to remember these guys existed um, before our founding fathers did, right? This age of enlightenment, most of these thinkers were alive and then dead um, before you know, the revolution took place in the 13 colonies. But it doesn't mean that their ideas didn't influence our founding fathers, as you'll see. So first we'll look at Locke. This is John Locke. I'm going to try to zoom in on him. He was alive 1632 to 1704. Not important that you memorize the date, but I just want you to think about the French and Indian War um, happened in 1763, and then all of the tax acts that happened after that leading up to um, the revolution in 1776. So he's gone like a solid 60 years before that happens. So what does Locke believe? A couple different things. So please jot these down. The first, I don't know why it's not zooming in properly. Sorry. Is that, there we go. All people are born equal with a blank slate, a tabula rasa. Like our brains are just and our lives, our personalities only develop because of the experiences we have. But we're all born blank slate, blank page, all identical, basically. Um, and he says we're born into the state of nature. The state of nature is a world without government. So we are free to do as we want. Just party, make your own rules, doesn't really matter, have a good time. Um, but not so much, and we'll get to that. Locke believes that all people have three natural rights. Those rights are life, liberty, and property. What does he mean by natural rights, though? He means that, like, just because you exist, just because you're a living thing, you have the right to these three items. Um, life, literally meaning, like, your life, um, you should be free from being killed or injured or harmed. Liberty, which means freedom. Um, you shouldn't be, you know, thrown into a cage. You shouldn't be forced into handcuffs without any good reason. Um, that your freedom to move around the world shouldn't be taken away from you. And then also the right to property. What is yours is yours, and other people can't steal your stuff. He says that um, even though we're born into that state of nature where we can have whatever rules we want, we choose to make a government so that they can help protect those three natural rights. He says without a government, like we would be fighting for those rights all the time and they'd be at risk. So we sacrifice some freedoms to get a government to protect our natural rights. But what happens if your government is terrible and they don't protect those rights? They don't protect your life, liberty, and property. Well, he says, overthrow it, get rid of it, get rid of the government and get a new one. All right, we'll see you later, Locke. The next guy up is Voltaire. I like his little cheesy uh, smirk here. He's alive 1694 to 1726. A little, little uh, longer than Locke stuck around. So Voltaire is a deist. Deism um, basically says God made the universe and then said, bye, don't ruin it. So he wasn't actually religious. He just said, it makes sense to me. It seems logical that a higher power created the world and our job is to not screw it up. He is for um, freedom of speech he is against censorship, and he is for freedom of religion. So speech, say what you want if you dare, Voltaire, right? Like the government can't tell you to stop talking or acting a certain way, even if it's rude or offensive. It doesn't matter. Speak your mind. 
he's against censorship. He says that you should be able to express yourself and the government can't limit that. He also is for freedom of religion. And this is twofold. This is important, guys. Number one, the government can't force you to practice a religion. So tomorrow, the president can't get up and give a speech and say, hey, uh, everybody now needs to be Protestant. If you aren't, we'll throw you in jail. He says, that's wrong. He also says that they can't stop you from practicing a religion, no matter how ridiculous it is. So if I wake up tomorrow and say, I am now a member of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, which it's a thing, you can Google it, um, I can't be punished for that or someone can't force me to give that up. It's my my personal belief. Um he thought government and the church should operate separately. So the people that make the laws need to be set the government, right? Needs to be apart from like your religious leaders and your church leaders. Um, that having a religious ruler or a government that forces religion on you is a bad thing and can be dangerous and lead to corruption. Next up is Montesquieu. He is alive 1689 to 1755. Look at those wavy locks. Um, <clears throat> his is really simple, and it should be kind of familiar to you guys. Montesquieu says, government should be divided into three branches, a legislative branch to make laws, an executive branch to enforce laws, and a judicial branch that interprets the laws and figures out how they apply in the real world. He says that these branches need checks and balances. Um, Without having three branches, the government would get too powerful. It could mess with people's rights. It could uh, ruin our freedoms. It could become tyrannical. Um, so we divide the government into three branches. And the best way to remember Montesquieu and three branches of government, he's the guy with the longest name, the only one with a three-syllable name. So Montesquieu for three branches of government, executive, judicial, and legislative. All right, last but not least is Rousseau, the Frenchman, quite obviously. Rousseau is alive 1712 to 1778. So he actually kind of knows a little bit about the uh, unrest that's brewing in the colonies. So um, Rousseau says when there's no government, very much like what Locke said, we end up in a state of of nature. And I just want to review that definition again with you. The state of nature is when people exist without government. There are no rules, no laws, people left up to their own devices. Unlike Locke, he's really kind of negative about the state of nature. You know, Locke said, we create a government um, because they'll help protect our life, liberty, and property. And Rousseau says, listen, y'all, we are greedy. The state of nature is bad. Like, it is not an option for us. So he says people start to believe in this social contract. They create an agreement between the government, the people and the government. We give up some of our freedoms in exchange for help from that government. So, you know what, now I can't... Uh, go out and loot a store and I can't like run around outside without any clothes on or I can't punch someone in the face without a consequence. Not that I want to do any of these things. I don't. But people do crazy things when there are no rules, right? So he says, we're going to give up some of those weird freedoms in exchange for protection and guidance from our government. But how do we prevent the government then from becoming too powerful? Like if we sacrifice our freedoms and give them to a government, what if that government becomes corrupt? Um, Rousseau says the way the government doesn't become corrupt is that they have to do the people's will. This is called popular sovereignty or majority will, a.k.a. listen to the people. The government should do what the people want within reason, right? All their decisions should be based on the populace and what citizens want. But they're there kind of as a buffer in case we want something stupid. They can say, hey, guys, this isn't in your best interest. Maybe you shouldn't do it. All right, that's all I have for you. Hope you learned something new about the Enlightenment philosophers.